All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the OVS VAP Training Center webinar, Coaching Employees to High Performance. I'm Blake Cush, I'm the Director of Training and Outreach at OVS. In the coming weeks, many of you have officially started the transition forward and are reopening or returning to in-office and possible in-person work. And we know that that comes with a time of transition that includes excitement, challenges, some questions, and we're here to support you in that process. So today's webinar is actually our fifth in our new Transition Forward webinar series, which was, the develop, which was developed with the goal of helping you tackle some of these unique challenges. A list of the upcoming trainings offered in the Transition Forward webinar series is going to come up on your screen here in just a second, but it's also available on our website at ovs.ny.gov forward slash training. Each webinar is, including today's, is recorded. You may have heard that just a minute ago. Those links to the recordings are also available on that same training page, and they can be accessed via our OVS training YouTube channel. Uh, as soon as you exit today's webinar, you'll be directed to an evaluation survey on the presentation. Please take a couple minutes and give us your feedback. You also have an opportunity there to notify us if you're interested in receiving more training and follow up on a variety of uh, other training topics. One thing to note about that is that when you do exit the webinar, sometimes a pop-up will come up from WebEx pr prompting you or indicating that you're being redirected to a research.net website. It is safe, it is secure, it's a part of our SurveyMonkey tool that we use for all of our evaluations. So please give us your feedback, we really, really appreciate it. Today's webinar will be led by Jenny Amstutz of JA Strategies and Alan Krieger of Krieger Solutions. Jenny and Alan have more than 40 years of combined experience in consulting and training, working with nonprofits and agencies around the state of New York, and both have also served as executive directors of nonprofit organizations, and both have master's degrees in management. Uh, with that, I'd like to formally welcome Jenny and Alan to get us started. Okay, thanks, Blake. I know most of you have been on a lot of these webinars already, but just in case, we always like to start with a little orientation to WebEx. If you move your cursor anywhere on the bottom of your screen, click on it, this uh, menu should pop up. And in, somewhere in the middle of the menu is a uh, circle with a bubble inside. It could be black or it could be blue. If you haven't opened the chat box yet, it'll be black. Once you click it and it's open, it's blue. We'd like you to open the chat box because if you have any questions, comments, uh, we'd like to hear you, uh, hear what they are and uh, respond to them as we go through it. And over to the right, if you look at the chat box, there's a small um, box at the bottom that says 2TO, and it may say uh, someone's name or it could say all panelists. And please set it to all panelists because we don't all monitor the chat box at any one time, but somebody's always monitoring it. So if it's all panelists, uh, we'll be sure to see it. We're going to answer your questions as they come in, but also some of them will wait till the end. And at the end, we'll be answer any questions we've missed or any additional questions you have. In a few minutes, you're going to be given an opportunity to participate in an online poll. Uh, a box will pop up towards the right-hand side of your screen. You'll have a, a limited amount of time, 30 seconds to a minute or so, to uh, answer the questions. And after you're done, if you want to close it, you can hit a box in the upper right corner uh, once the poll's finished, we'll share the results. It'll pop up again. You'll see what everybody said. It's anonymous. And, um, and then we'll uh, continue on with the session. Okay, so our goals for this webinar is uh, to talk about what the coaching approach is and how you can use it more effectively with your staff. Specifically, we're going to discuss the difference between coaching and traditional leadership and how coaching can actually make the leader's job easier. We're going to explore how coaching can help improve employee performance and where and when coaching is most appropriate. We'll also present a six-step coaching process and discuss how you can best use this with your employees. We'll wrap up with an action plan for you to outline how you can use the coaching approach on the job with your team. Coaching is a word we use a lot, but... Oops, there it goes. What is coaching? Um, and a lot of people have different definitions for it. Some people, when they think about a sports coach or maybe a life coach, and they're not sure how it applies in the workplace. Here's a quote from actually a famous sports coach that we think applies very well in the workplace. A coach is someone who tells you what you don't want to hear, who has you see what you don't want to see, so you can be who you've always known you can be. 
That's by Tom Landry, who coached the Dallas Cowboys for a very successful 29 years. As Landry says, a coach is a supervisor who believes in helping employees continually grow to be the best worker they can. Here's another definition of coaching. It's a supervisory style that focuses on building performance by increasing both employee competence and commitment. Most supervisors know they need to make sure their employees are competent, and they know how to train new employees. They often don't know how to build employee commitment. Our last webinar on motivation presented a lot of strategies that build commitment. These are all part of the strategies of a coach. In this time of remote working, I've coached some folks who have hired people who after the lockdown, so they've never met in person. It's hard to engage with somebody. And again, we think the coaching approach will give you some good strategies to do that as you transition back to work. Coaches help employees develop their skills, knowledge, and ability to improve their competence. And by working with their employees on this closely, they also build employee commitment. Here are some of the principles and strategies that coaches use to build commitment. The two main principles are first, that they try to tie an employee's passion and talents to the work they do. This could include helping employees see how their job contributes to things they feel are important. It could also include tailoring a job where possible to better fit the employee's natural skills. If people feel passionate about their work and the job makes good use of their talents, then they're likely to be very satisfied and highly motivated. So coaches work to customize the workplace, recognizing that there's a job to be done and we don't completely turn it around, but we do try to make it as uh, best fitted to each employee as possible. Or sometimes it's just helping them see how well it fits. Another principle that guides coaches is that their job is to create an environment in which their employees can flourish, as opposed to forcing employees into a box from which they have to perform. Our webinar on motivation provided a number of strategies for creating a positive work environment. You may be starting to see that coaching is a very active form of supervision. It requires more of an investment from the supervisor, and the payoff is that you get higher performance, increased retention, and a much more pleasant workplace. We think that's a good deal. Effective coaches build a workplace where they have to spend a lot less time putting out fires, resolving conflicts, or dealing with unmotivated employees. So how do coaches do this? First, the coach makes sure that employees have the skills they need to get the job done. Then they give each employee a clear set of expectations, but let the employee decide how they want to organize and do their work. Coaches also involve employees in many of the decisions that affect the unit overall. Another key strategy of a coach is to ask a lot of questions instead of always giving directions. This helps employees find their own answers and feel fully engaged. And finally, a coach uses mistakes as opportunities to teach employees rather than reprimanding them, thereby turning a potential negative into a positive. So you can see that coaches are more active and engaged than a traditional supervisor would be. While coaching takes more time and energy, the rewards of a high-performance workplace are well worth it. We're going to do a quick poll to see which of these coaching strategies you already use. I want you to think honestly about your own supervisory strategies and actions. When you're working with your direct reports, how often do you use each of these? Almost always, often, sometimes, rarely, or never? We'll give you about a minute to think about your responses and then answer. So decide quickly. Remember, this is anonymous, so be honest in your responses. Poll is open on the right-hand side there. And there are, I think, four questions, so you want to scroll down once you answer the first two. After you've answered all four, then hit the submit button. Do scroll down and make sure you answer them all. We have about 45 seconds left, should be halfway through. Uh, 
about 20 seconds left. Make sure you get the questions answered. And don't forget to hit the submit button. Okay, time's just about up. Hit submit. Okay, so the poll is closed. We're going to share the results with you in just a minute. Okay, so there are the results showing on the right-hand side. Um, I let my direct reports decide how to do their jobs, and that was uh, a good number of you chose A and B, so almost always and often, over 50%. And um, I involved my direct reports and decisions affecting them. This one had even higher, over 60%. That's 60% of everybody, and 20% uh, didn't respond, so it's a quite a high percentage. And then uh, number three, I give, uh, I ask more questions than I give directions. This one had a less in the almost always, but more in the often and sometimes, again, uh, over 60%. And I use mistakes as learning opportunities. This one, people rated very high as almost always. And again, combined, it's uh, well over 60%. So a lot of you uh, seem to have taken on the coaching strategies, which is great. Um, you've got the foundation, but we hope today we'll present kind of a model and a framework uh, that can uh, pull it together for you. So Jenny's going to take it away. All right, great. Um, so we are going to start talking a little bit about the roles of us uh, tra traditional supervisors versus uh, supervisors as coaches. And traditional supervisors have four primary roles. They direct their staff to do the work. Uh, they tell people how to do the job. Uh, they monitor people's output, and they confront employees who are not performing well. Uh, but supervisors who act as coaches take a very different approach. Instead of directing their employees, they guide them. They ask questions to help their employees figure out the best way to get the work done, and they try and challenge employees in a positive way. Instead of just telling people how to do the job, they teach. So again, employees learn the job at a deeper level, and they're able to problem solve when situations arise. Coaches give employees feedback as they learn to help them continually improve. Coaches monitor output, but they also evaluate the ability and effort of the employees with an eye for the employee's improvement. Uh, they include, encourage their employees to assess themselves and where possible to, serve, to solve their own problems. And finally, before they confront someone with a problem, coaches look for ways to engage and motivate their employees to produce high performance. They try and connect with each employee in their own way and empower employees to have as much autonomy as they can handle. Coaches are not afraid to confront when they need to, but they try for supportive confrontation as much as possible, using mistakes as learning opportunities, as many of you already said that you do. Uh, we have another poll for you now to give us a sense of what you think about coaching from what you've heard so far. Uh, hopefully you can see where in many situations coaching can be a more effective leadership strategy, but knowing it is effective, and actually implementing it can be two different things, especially when we find ourselves in the extraordinary circumstances that we have over the last few months. So we'd like you to think about how much you agree or disagree that coaching will be easy to implement as a leadership approach in your workplace. Feel free to add a couple of comments in the chat box as to why you chose the answer you did. We're only giving you about 30 seconds for this one because it's a pretty quick question. So. Uh, go ahead and pick your answer. Pick pick your answer and then hit submit. All right. So the poll is now closed, and the answers uh, will be published in just a second. It always takes WebEx a few seconds to calculate. Okay, so uh, so we can see that um, 19 of, of 105 of you said it, you strongly agreed that it would be easy to implement and 33 of you said that it um, said it, you agreed. So you know those are pretty high numbers and only a few of you either disagreed or strong, strongly disagreed. Um, 
One comment said they agree in theory, but some staff do better with coaching and autonomy while others seem to need more guidance and direction. And I think that's a really good point. And we're going to talk about that in a little while. And it may have to do with various reasons, their style or um, it may be how long they've been on the job. But I think that, that that's an excellent point that, you know, different different employees respond better to different different types of direction or coaching. So we're going to keep going at this point. Um, but thank you for your participation. I'm not surprised that everybody there, we had so many strong, strongly agrees and agrees based on your responses to the first poll. Um, so we want to give you a couple of examples here because sometimes it's easier to understand the difference between traditional supervision and coaching when you can experience the difference, really hear the difference of the two approaches. Uh, so we're going to do a quick couple of quick demonstrations of both the traditional approach and the coaching approach to working with employees. So the first scenario involves a relatively new employee who came to the job with some relevant experience and has been on the job for about two months. Uh, we're going to run the scenario two ways. Uh, first, the situation is played out with a supervisor using a more traditional supervisory style. And then the second time we run it, the supervisor will use more of a coaching style. So as you listen to the scenario, think about how the employees might feel, be feeling at the end of each scene and what the pros and cons are of the coaching approach from the supervisor's perspective. Now today we're very lucky that Blake um, and Rachel have agreed to be our um, demonstrators for you. So today in this first scene, Blake is a supervisor talking to Rachel about a task they're working on. And remember, Rachel is a relatively new uh, employee, but she's not brand new. She's been there a couple of months. Hi, Rachel. Hey. So you got a minute here. I want, I want you to take a second and review with what you need, with what needs to be done to prepare for our meeting. It's basically the same as you did for the last meeting. You need to be sure all the materials have been sent out at least three days in advance, along with the agenda. We also need a list of initiatives uh, you can use to record it, or excuse me, invitees you can use to record um, the attendance. Test out the PowerPoint and Zoom connection. Make sure that the videos will play and the documents you will need uh, to share are all open on your computer. Meeting starts at 10. I'd like you to be there to set up before 9.15 and report back to me and let me know you're all set. You have any questions? Um, no, no I, I think I'm all set. Like you said, it's the same as we did for the last meeting. So um, I'll get you a set of materials right away so you can review and make sure I have it right, and then I'll get it all set on the morning of the meeting and report back by 9.15. Great, thanks. Okay, now we're going to have here the scene again, um, but this time Blake is going to use more of a coaching style instead of the traditional supervisory style. Hey, Rachel. So we have a, another meeting coming up next week that needs to be set up as the last one was. I think you have everything you need to get to get it set, but I wanted to give you a chance to check with me if you have any questions or need anything from me. Oh, great. I think I'm all set. Okay, so just to be sure, can you give me a quick recap of what your understanding is? Sure. Um, you want me to get all the materials out in advance with an agenda. I'll get an invitee list and have it on hand and all key documents loaded on my computer for screen sharing. Um, I'll plan to run a text check well before the meeting starts. Is that everything? That's great. I'm glad you got this straight. Thank you. Uh, one last quick question, though. What's your time frame for getting it done? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll get the materials out at least three days before the meeting, and then I'll get it all set up and tested in the morning by 9.15. I'll let you know that everything is good to know go then. Awesome. That's perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. Great. Thank you, Blake and Rachel. So now I want you to take a second to think about the two scenarios and the difference between them. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions so, and ask you to put your thoughts into the chat box. So first, I want you to think about how Rachel was feeling at the end of each scene. Uh, that first scene, um, the first, you know, the, the scenario, the first, the first time we went through it and the second time. So, you know, type in the chat box, what, how do you think Rachel was feeling at the end of the first one versus at the end of the second one? Any thoughts? So, so she's feeling much more supported in the second one. Uh, uh, in the traditional one, Rachel may have felt like her supervisor didn't have much confidence in her ability, and maybe she was undervalued. Um, some just seemed like she was told a to-do list in the first one. 
Um, and the second one, Rachel walks away feeling more confident about her work, that she has the competencies to do it. Um, she's, um, she definitely is more confident in the first one and the, or in the second one. And in the first one, the thought was she's more, you are the boss and I'm the employee um, versus in the second one, you know, it was really clear that she had some skills. So. I liked Perfect. one that came directly to me that said that she sounded very annoyed at her supervisor <laughs> after the first one. Um, right. Okay. Right. And I think that, you know, and that's a good point. So how does it, you know, so, and that could lead to further conflict along the way. So, you know, you know, how that, you know, how that plays out longer. Um, so in the second one, you know, in the coaching approach, Rachel feels like her a supervisor has confidence the way she's doing. So I think those are some great insights. Um, you know, so in the second one, she's empowered. The first one is not really a, a good working relationship. Uh, we did get one comment that somebody couldn't hear either Blake or Rachel. So we're going to do a second scenario and maybe they will uh, turn up their mics or a little close, um, uh, a little louder. And then the last comment, and then I'll, and I'll move on. It says, at the end of the first conversation, she sounded kind of stunned because of the way the duties were directed to her. Um, so the second one, she was able to communicate to her supervisor that she already knew what she was doing. So it's really different, you know, there's the, Rachel feels very differently. And then, you know, what, so what's the advantage of the coaching approach from Blake's perspective? Again, put your thoughts into the, you know, so we, we can see why it was benefited Rachel. She felt better at the end. What might be the benefit for Blake to use the coaching approach? He's empowering. So it's empowerment. He's, he's, he's empowering his, direct report to do her job. What else? Uh, it gives him the chance to focus on other things. So I think that's a good point. Um, this, that his staff will be more uh, confident in the work that they do. Uh, he can depend more on her in the future. So he really is building that level of trust. He doesn't have to worry about it because she's shown that she's done it. She knows what she's doing. He's expending a lot less energy. Um, yeah, and he feels more confident in her to complete the assignment using the coaching method. So that's great. I think that's those are some really great comments. Uh, so we're gonna now uh, do another scenario. And this time Blake will play the more experienced, uh, play the, the employee. And in this case, he's a more experienced employee than Rachel was, but he's not, he's having some performance issues. Again, the first run through will have um, the supervisor who is Rachel this time using a more traditional supervisory style. And the second, um, she'll be using more of a coaching perspective. Um, I, again, as you listen to the scenario, think again about how the employee uh, Blake was feeling at the end of each scene um, and what the pros and cons are of the coaching approach. So this is Rachel, the supervisor, talking with Blake, a more experienced and highly skilled employee who did not do well on a task. Okay. Blake, I want to talk with you about the way that you interact with your coworkers. What's the problem? I've gotten some feedback from your coworkers that when they ask you for assistance, you've been very rude. They say you talk to them harshly and in a way that makes them feel disrespected. Some of them are overly sensitive. Besides, it's not my job to help them out. You're the supervisor. That's your job. Yes. Some of them can be somewhat sensitive, and it is my job as a supervisor to help them out. I also want to see our unit operating as a team. I expect team members to help one another. When I'm available, I'm happy to help out as well, but I'm often tied up in meetings, and at those times, I'd like to see you chip in to help other people out with questions or a difficult situation. Okay, fine. I'll help them out. That's great. Thanks. I also want you to act in a kind and supportive manner when you help them. No harsh or dismissive comments. Some positive enthusiasm would be even better. Okay, whatever. Okay, now we're going to hear it again with Rachel using more of a coaching approach. Hey, Blake. I wanted to talk to you for a second. I've gotten some feedback about the way you interact with your coworkers. What's your sense of how that's going? Oh, you've heard from the whiners. Well, what's your take on that? And some of them are too sensitive, and they don't like the way I talk with them. They're always asking me for help, and it's not my job to help them out. You're the supervisor. That's your job. I'm trying to get my work done, and when they interrupt me, it slows me down. Yeah, you do great work, and I can understand your frustration with interruptions. 
I also agree that some of them can be somewhat sensitive, and it is my job as a supervisor to help them out when I'm available. I also want to see that our unit operates as a team. I expect team members to help one another. Do you have any suggestions on how to build our unit into a better team? People, if people would save up their questions and only interrupt me once or twice a day, that would help. I agree. It would be good to limit the number of times they interrupt you. I'll talk with them about batching their questions and maybe going in together so you won't be interrupted so much. What about when they need to get an answer quickly and can't wait for the once a day meeting? Well, I guess if they need it quickly, maybe they could email me their questions so I can at least finish what I'm working on before I have to stop and respond. Actually, that might be an even better way to do it because this way I'll give them a written answer and they'll have it as a reference so they won't have to ask me again later. Maybe we can post it somewhere for others to see. I just get sick of getting asked the same question over and over. Oh, that's a great idea. I know it can be really frustrating to keep answering the same question, and the written reply really helps solve that as well. Thank you. I think we can make this happen. I have one final concern. What about when someone has an urgent question that's too complicated to write up? They may not be really sure exactly what they need from you. Would it be okay for them to come directly to you in those situations? Uh, it doesn't, I guess, that doesn't happen too often. So I guess as long as they're thoughtful about it, I'm okay with the occasional, you know, in-person interruption. I think I'll probably write it up, write it up anyway, so others can still have it of a reference, but I'll explain it to the person in person. Oh, thanks, Blake. <laughs> You're really an expert on this, and I appreciate your willingness to help out. Your suggestions are great, and I'll talk with the other staff to let them know about this new process. I'll encourage them to come to me first, but on days that I'm tied up in meetings, we'll set up a time for them to meet with you about any questions they have. I'll also encourage them to email you questions if it's urgent and to strictly limit once or twice a week the times they interrupt you in person. How does that sound? Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Blake and Rachel. We got at least one comment talking about the excellent acting that we heard. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we won't have the type in for the comments again, although I think it was good just to save time. But I hope that uh, you see that in the first scenario, uh, there was really no buy-in from Blake. He was feeling discounted and unappreciated, um, and he grudgingly agreed to go along with uh, Rachel's suggestion, but he probably won't. Uh, so in the second scenario, Rachel put Blake in the lead on the discussion and on problem solving. While he came up with a pretty rigid and awkward way to handle things, uh, it works for him, and he seems more bought into it. Uh, so it's more likely he'll follow through in a more positive way. Uh, Rachel was also able to negotiate a bit on behalf of the other employees to make Blake's strategy a bit more flexible and user-friendly. You probably noticed that the second approach was was more challenging for Rachel. Uh, it took more time, and Rachel had to hold back on, on comments and stay in a facilitative role. Uh, but eventually, they got to what will be a most, much more positive resolution um, for everybody there. So that, as somebody said in the comments, the second Sarah scenario develops better communication to solve the issue. So it's a positive outcome, even though uh, Blake was a little resistant at the beginning. Uh, so Blake and Rachel just demonstrated two approaches to coaching. So we're going to uh, f review further some of the key elements of a successful coach. This is an expansion of the list that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar. So a coach tries to find ways to challenge employees in a positive way. Uh, coaches want to be aware and respond to each employee's needs and preferences while still ensuring that the work gets done and the employees are productive. Coaches are always on the lookout for successful performance both large, in large ways and in small, small performance ways, uh, and make a point of acknowledging and appreciating the good work of the, their employees and their direct reports. Uh, coaches work to drive out fear and build trust by using mistakes as learning opportunities instead of sources of punishment. Uh, by doing this, employees are much more likely to bring problems and mistakes to the supervisor's attention instead of trying to hide them or sweep them under the rug so they don't get in trouble. Uh, in addition to positive feedback, coaches also regularly give constructive, corrective feedback to help employees who aren't performing well find their way back to high performance. And this feedback is based on clear performance expectations and clear statements of the behavior that failed to meet these expectations. Coaches always take time when giving corrective feedback and throughout the day to listen, really listen to their employees. They're, that way they're hearing their thoughts and their ideas, their concerns and their feelings. Uh, coaches use active listening, letting employees know that they fully hear their message, and facilitating the employee's exploration about how they might best address their concerns. 
Coaches strive to continually keep their employees in the loop by seeking their input on on important decisions and keeping them aboard as changes are taking place. Coaches make a point of treating employees with respect and with dignity at all times. That that way they're treating each employee as an individual and responding as much as possible to each employee's individual styles. So I'm going to turn it over to Alan now, who's going to talk a little bit about when it's best to use coaching. We hope you can see from uh, and from your comments, it sounds like you see the benefits of coaching, both to the employee and the coach. And it's a great strategy. It does take more time and energy. Nobody uh, cited that as a comment, but it, it said just it's easier to tell people what to do and walk away, but it doesn't really work. Uh, so in the long run, coaching saves you time and energy, but in the short run, a little bit more of an investment. I want to think about when do we want to use coaching and maybe when shouldn't we? It doesn't work in every case. So it's most effective when there's a trusting relationship between the supervisor and the employee and with employees who respond well to supportive supervision. Coaching can be used with great employees to help them stay great. It doesn't have to be just with problem employees. Even the best workers uh, can benefit from coaching. I learned that when I heard Michael Jordan really relied on his coach, as did Tiger Woods in his prime. Uh, They were great, and they still benefited from coaching. It's also essential when helping good employees move from good to great. It builds both confidence and commitment, as we said earlier, and that helps an employee shine in the best way they can. It can also be very effective with poor performers who are open to feedback and trying to change. Coaching is not appropriate in an emergency situation. When things have to happen fast, be directive. Also, coaching is ineffective in situations where the employees have no trust or don't have any kind of a positive relationship with their supervisor, and they act from an us versus them approach. In those cases, we have to be more directive and work to win that trust and work to build that relationship, and then we can eventually uh, move back to coaching. Coaching may be appropriate when the relationship is strained or the employee is disillusioned, but there's some sense of basic trust and the employee hasn't given up completely. It's always worth the effort to give coaching a try, but recognize that there are cases where it won't be effective. Coaching is a strategic process, and before having a coaching meeting with an employee, it's important to think about the employee and the conversation. On this slide are some of the steps a coach might take prior to the coaching session to help strategize and come up with a plan that will be most successful. It's important to identify exactly what behavior the employee is doing or failing to do that's problematic. It's also important to clearly state your performance expectation in measurable terms. We'll have more about that in our next webinar on performance evaluation. Make sure the employee understands it the same way you do. Think about the employee's skills and their knowledge about the job. Do they know how to do the job? Think about their motivation. Do they have an incentive for doing the job right? Does it really matter? Also consider whether they seem to agree or disagree with your expectations for what good performance is. And if they agree, do they care about meeting that standard? That could be a measure of their commitment. And finally, honestly assess whether they could really do the job the way you expect even if they were well-trained and fully committed. Is it possible that there are factors outside their control that might be getting in the way? When you've thought all this through, then you'll be ready to effectively facilitate the coaching conversation. Informal coaching is a lot easier when we're all in the same place. Uh, Doing it remotely is a little bit more difficult. You can't just drop in. You have to kind of schedule the time to meet. But it could be you're having a conversation where the employee calls you about a question um, or you're calling the employee to tell them about a change in a meeting time and something comes up and you can use that conversation as an opportunity for informal coaching. Basically, you catch employees during the day who may be performing well and you let them know how much you appreciate that. And where relevant, maybe you give them a tip or a challenge to help them continue to grow. So a coach is always looking for opportunities to continually help employees improve and grow. Similarly, you can catch employees who do part of the job well and work with them to perfect the rest of the job. And finally, employees who are doing a poor job can be coached to understand what's expected, where they fall short, to help them figure out how they can improve. So if you're calling an employee to give them some 
corrective feedback about an issue or they call you to complain about something, you could take that opportunity and turn it into a, a short coaching conversation. So coaching is somewhat about a, uh, a sense of, of how you approach every conversation you have with an employee. But there's also a more formal approach and it follows a six step process. Coach begins by identifying the performance area they wish to discuss. This is for when there's a gap between what you expect and what the employee is doing. They're not meeting expectations. You might want to talk about one issue. You don't want to talk about more than one at a time. It could be time and attendance, how the employee relates to coworkers. It could be paperwork issues, issues related with client interaction. And if there's more than one, you have to choose one, uh, one at a time to work on. So once you've identified the area, uh, then the coach wants to clarify what their expectation is in terms in regard to that task, and then give some feedback about what they've observed regarding the employee's performance. And the feedback is basically that there's a gap between here's what I expect and here's what I see, and you're not working to the level I'm looking for. The goal is to show that the gap between the expectation and the actual performance is clear and shows a path to uh, moving forward. And that's really the end of the coach's presentation. It's about two sentences in all. From here on, the coach basically just asks questions, as Blake and Rachel demonstrated in their coaching scenarios. The first question is to invite the employee to comment on what the coach has just said. Often you don't have to invite them. They usually just start talking. The coach needs to listen carefully to the employee's response. And whether the coach agrees or not, they need to paraphrase back a summary of what the employee said. And you heard good examples of that in Blake and Rachel's coaching uh, approaches. They repeated in their own words what the employee was saying, let them know that they were being heard. Once the employee and the coach agree that the behavior happened as described and it falls short of the expectation, whether or not there are excuses or uh, other reasons that the employee wants to give, they've agreed that they're not meeting expectations. The coach asks the employee to think about how they can improve their performance. Coach tries to avoid giving advice unless the employee truly does not have any ideas. The key is for the employee to buy into the solution and not have it come down as a directive from the supervisor. Once the solution is agreed upon, then the coach continues to ask questions to help the employee plan what they need to do to successfully implement the solution. At that point, the employee begins to carry out the plan and the coach stays in close contact, providing support and ongoing feedback to help ensure employee success. A key part of the coaching process is how the coach facilitates problem solving. Again, this is mostly about asking questions, beginning with asking the employee what they can do differently. It's important to allow the employee time to think in a low pressure environment. Coaches need to listen carefully to whatever the employee comes up with and try to agree with as much as you can. And where you can't, then you try to use the yes and approach, uh, which we've talked about in other webinars, which basically tries to build on some of the employee's suggestions. You state the point that you can, I can agree with this, and what about if you also did that? Add to it, add a suggestion of your own. It's important that the employee ultimately buys into whatever the final agreement is. Again, as, coach, as uh, Rachel and uh, Blake both demonstrated, at the end of the coaching session, the employee was pretty much on board even though they didn't start there. If this stage can't be reached and the employee can't buy into a solution, then coaching won't be successful and a more traditional approach might be needed. As mentioned before, once the plan's in place, it's important to carefully follow up and keep checking in to make sure it's successful. That's how to coach and to address a performance problem. Jenny will take over now and talk a little bit about how to coach high performers. Great, thanks Alan. Um, and before I, just before I get into that, I want to say we, we have started to get questions about what we've talked about so far, and we will answer those at the end. So if you have questions, continue. I, so we, I don't want you to think that we're ignoring your questions. Uh, we will get to them. Uh, we're just going to finish the presentation and then handle questions at the end. Uh, so as Alan said, almost always the focus is on how to deal with our poor performers, uh, but it's also important to remember that we need to encourage our high-performing employees to continue their great performance and to stay working with us. If you were part of our webinar the last time, you know that this, this sort of work with high performers can be a real motivating factor for them. So the coaching approach, the coaching approach uh, works well for your high performers. It does have a slightly different process though than the one that Alan just talked about. It begins the same way with feedback, but in this case, you're giving strictly positive feedback. 
And uh, when you're identifying the gap, the gap is that you think that they may have the potential to do even more. Um, and I'm not here talking here about more work, but more different kinds of work and maybe work at a higher level. Uh, so once you share this feedback with them, you want to invite the employee to comment and share their thoughts about their areas for growth. Uh, if you and the employee identify an area they'd like to learn more about or new tasks they'd like to take on, uh, then your next step would be to generate a plan. Uh, again, just like with the, your poor performers, you want the employee to be in the lead and you as the coach to be asking the questions. Uh, once the general plan is in place, then it's necessary to put together specific strategies that will help you uh, and help them carry out the plan. As always, you want to conclude by giving uh, ongoing feedback and having regular check-ins. As I think you've seen, coaching is a more complicated approach to leadership than just your traditional supervisory relationship, your supervisory relationship. But it can produce excellent results, and we think it's well worth the effort. Uh, as you can see in the slide, there are many skills required to become an effective coach. So as you look at the slide, see if there are some key skills that you feel like you already excel in, and then look for one or two that you would like to strengthen or improve. At the end of the webinar, Rachel is going to upload a handout that has this assessment on it, um, as well as handouts that correspond to our next two slides. Uh, so take a moment at the end to download the handout so you can have a record of where you want to improve. Uh, we have conducted some webinars already on performance expectations, providing feedback, and motivating others, and those are available to assist you in developing these skills or any other coaching skills. Uh, those webinars are available on that training center website that uh, Blake talked about at the beginning of our webinar. Our next webinar in a few weeks is going to be on evaluating performance, uh, and that's another key skills for coach, key skill for coaches. Uh, so you have, and you may have other resources within your agency to help you sharpen all of your skills. So identify one or two again of these skills you'd like to work on. <coughs> you also take the time to think about people who may be able to coach you in each of these areas. It might be somebody within your agency, um, it, somebody you know that already does this especially well. It could be a friend or colleague, and it could be your supervisor. Have somebody in mind who can help you sharpen, the, sharpen your skills. Uh, think about other ways you can learn as well, through additional classes or practicing on the job or looking for other resources. Here's a, just a quick framework for you to think about if you want to try coaching one of your employees. As I said, this framework will also be in the handout that we're going to upload. So pick, first pick a specific area you're going to focus on. Uh, conduct your initial analysis, and then for each of the six steps, think about what you will do or what you will say to facilitate the conversation with the employee you're working with and the process. As you do this, think about any barriers or obstacles you think you might face and what you can do to overcome the barriers. And finally, find a partner that you can talk this through with, and ideally, if you have an opportunity to do it, to practice with. Role play a couple of different ways the conversation might go so you'll be ready for whatever scenario may come up. So this wraps up our webinar and, um, and we do have some time because it's only 1.45. So we'd like to, you to use the chat box for any additional questions you have and we're gonna respond to them as they come in. Uh, for any of, those, uh, any of those people on the webinar right now who need to leave early, please be sure to complete the evaluation that Blake mentioned at the beginning and it will pop up as you leave the webinar. Uh, we really do value your feedback and input, and we look at it before we do each one. Uh, while, you're, uh, while you're writing in your questions, I just want to do a quick review of the training and technical assistance request program that OVS is providing to all its funded agencies at no cost to you. If you've done other webinars, you've heard us talk about it, but we just want to make sure everybody's aware that Alan and I can provide a wide range of training, coaching, and consulting services to your staff, uh, to the other people at your agencies, or one-on-one. -on -one. And there's a link on the slide for more information. Uh, if you're not sure exactly how, my, how you might use us in your agency, we thought we could give you a few examples based on today's webinar. We can coach you to help you sharpen your coaching skills. We can help you plan for challenging coaching situations um, and help you think, about, think through how to best work with your staff to help them develop into high performers. We also provide a wide range of customized training focusing on leadership to help you build your own leadership skills. Uh, these, this might include a deeper understanding of different communication and work styles that will impact how employees prefer to be coached, uh, learning ways to better manage employee performance and in, including setting expectations and giving feedback, coaching and motivating your staff to improve performance, and helping you sort through any number of challenges you face, both in day-to-day -day work as well as managing through these crises. Uh, 
During this crisis that we find ourselves in now, OBS has made us available on an ad hoc basis to provide individual coaching to managers and leaders of funded agencies. We can serve as an independent sounding board for you to bounce off ideas and concerns during this transition. We can also help you explore new strategies to more effectively lead your team. If you'd like to find out more about this or sign up for coaching, go to the calendar link on your screen right now um, to set up an initial, or it's on your screen right now, you don't have to do it right now, to set up an initial session to explore whether this would be of value to you. All coaching sessions are completely confidential. We don't share the, what we talk about with anyone. The only thing we share is uh, your name and what agency you're from. Uh, there's no application needed and there's no charge for the service. So I'm gonna turn it over to Blake now uh, to wrap up the webinar, but we're gonna stay on and answer any questions you have. Uh, please write your questions again in the chat box. We've already gotten a few um, and we're gonna to respond to them before we sign off. But if you have questions that you don't have a chance to ask today, feel free to also email us. Uh, you can also email us to find out more about the additional services we offer. Uh, you can use the same calendar link to set up a phone call to talk with us about our services um, or use our email addresses that are right there. Uh, Blake, do you want to wrap us wrap us up? Yeah, so stick around if you want to answer some or have some uh, time for Q&A. We're happy to answer questions. A special thank you to Jenny and Alan for putting together another awesome webinar. Don't forget to do your evaluation. As Jenny alluded, we really do appreciate the feedback that comes into that. Uh, we do have another webinar next week on supporting others in managing stress, and you can register and check that out on the ovs.ny.gov forward slash training page. Give us a day or so too. We will. This webinar uh, um, was recorded, but it takes a little bit uh, for us to get it all cleaned up and ready for publishing on YouTube. So by the, if not the end of tomorrow, early Monday, we'll have it sent out to all of you in an email as well. So you have a link to that. But thank you everyone for joining us, and we'll start answering some questions. Hey, yeah, we have a number of uh, good questions here. Um, one is, what would be a good coaching approach to talking to an employee about them participating in a meeting? in meetings a few minutes later on a consistent basis, specifically someone who's a supervisor that other staff are looking up to. But one key to giving good feedback, which is the start of the coaching, is to have a clear statement of impact. And this person probably feels like, all right, I'm, I'm very busy. I have a lot to do. Meetings never start on time. I could be a few minutes late. What's the big deal? And so you have to make that clear. You have to say, look, people look up to you. We're trying to get our meetings starting on time. When you as a leader are late, then nobody else feels like coming on time and it just begins to mushroom and we start later and later. So I want you to demonstrate you know, good leadership uh, exper uh, practices, you're a role model uh, for your staff and, um, and people will do as you do. So I, I'd like you to be on time. So I think the important thing is they're letting them know what, why it matters and that you really care about it and that it's, imp it's important to you, you think it's important to the agency and you want them. So then the next thing would be to switch the question. So what gets in the way of you being on time? Let's, what, what can we do? Well, I've got a lot going on. People call me. Okay, how can you better plan the transition to be able to be at the meeting on time? What are some things you can do? So you begin to, you know, not hold their feet to the fire, but continue to ask them questions about how can we solve this problem? And obviously they have to solve this. Nothing that you can do. Jenny, anything you want to add? Or you want to pick up another one? No, you know, I think that yeah, I'll I'll take up the next one. But you know, I I think I think you're right, Alan. I think you know, just you know, you can you can try and elicit in initially, you know, ask questions to see if they have a sense of what the impact is. You know, what do you think the impact is of your being late to these meetings when you have people that you supervise who are at these meetings? How do you think it makes them feel? You know, so to have them start thinking about it. But I think making sure you know, setting down the expectation and then asking questions and helping them devise their own plan how to make sure that they actually are there on time is, you know, what Alan said is exactly right. Um, so one comment slash question is, uh, this should be a top-down approach. If supervisors are not being coached, how can they coach? Uh, these webinars are fine, but should be mandated in, or in order to work. And I think that, you know, in theory, that's great. But I, what we're hoping here is, you know, for, for some of us who have been lucky, to, lucky enough to have coaching supervisors, this may be behaviors that we already have. Um, or no, because it's been modeled for us by our own supervisors. What we're hoping from these webinars is even if you don't have a supervisor who models a coaching behavior, it's something that you can that you can begin to use with your own uh, direct reports uh, so that at least you can have a stronger and better relationship with those people, even if you're not, you don't have that same sort of coaching relationship uh, with your supervisor themselves. So yeah, we, you know, of course we would love everything that we do to make be mandated because 
um, <laughs> as we think it's important. But um, but sometimes you know sometimes we have to you know, we have to work with what we have, and at least we can at least start to model good behavior with our with our own employees, and maybe even your supervisor will see that see that behavior and see that change in the way that you, the the coaching relationship that you have with your own direct reports and you know hopefully we'll we'll learn from that as well. Alan, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, uh, we have a program we call Coaching Up, uh which actually helps middle managers think about how to coach their supervisor, the person who supervises them. And it it's basically the same process, just a little more eggshell. Um uh but that, you know, hey boss, when you don't give me feedback when you yell at me. Whatever it may be doing, it makes it hard for me to to do my job well. And I would appreciate it if you could do more of that. You know, so it's a very gentle request, but it's kind of begins to point them in in a direction. So something you might think about. Uh, somebody also said, uh, what would you suggest for a person who's reluctant to both approaches, both the directive and the coaching approach? Um, Again, I think the key is what a good coach does is build a relationship. If there's a way you can build that trust, build some kind of a connection with the person, um, if you get them at a place where they are willing to listen to you and they trust you, uh, you can coach. In the interim, um, there's a directive approach. And basically, if they're not comfortable, you you are the leader. You have been appointed by the agency to fulfill a, a function. And your function is to make sure that the employees are carrying out the mission and values of the agency. And if you have an employee who is working against that in any way, by being late, by being rude, by being incompetent, you know, then your job is to correct that. And the best way to correct it is to get them working well. The other way to correct it is to have them not working for you. And you know, I think people are very hesitant to uh, to take that hard line because we're social social workers, social service workers. We, we're out to help our clients and Yes, we want to help our employees, but our employees are paid people, paid to do a job, paid to carry out the mission of the agency. And if they're not, you know, they're taking away from our ability to serve our clients. And so they, you want to work with them. You want to give them ample choice. It's a progressive discipline. You don't start off by firing anybody. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, that has to be the point. You give the person a warning and say, unless you can change, you can't continue to work here. Your, your performance is not satisfactory. Now you got people who just split the line. They're they're okay. You can't fire them, but they're not very good. And for those people, there's some hope. They're okay. I would you know work to to motivate them, to engage them, to to try to bring them on. Um, but ultimately, if they're a bad influence, if they kind of poison the well, and other people begin to act poorly as a result, or resent them, or it's becoming you know divisive in the agency, um, they need to be spoken with very sternly in a traditional supervisory approach. This is the problem. I need to see it change. What are you going to do about it? And if they don't do anything about it, then you have a progressive discipline policy. It's not anything. It's it's a last resort. It's not a quick switch to that. But but I think ultimately that's uh, that's where you want to go. If you want to try the other two first, and then ultimately that's the the last choice. I have a question that came in earlier. Um, it was that the the Acting was incredible, so that was really most of it. But at both scenarios, it seemed that uh, both of the people that were being coached were already quite high performing. So it was more of a way to talk to them to empower them. But is there any sort of example or any tips that you can give that includes constructive feedback for an entry level employee or someone who maybe you might ask those questions, but they don't have everything? How can you give room for coaching, but also make sure everything gets done properly? I think that's a good point. You know, so it, you know, in in one sense, sometimes it may you you may need to be not quite as as open to all of their suggestions coming in, but still, you know, asking the questions. How do you how do you think you might handle this situation? What are your ideas? Um, and then providing feedback on those ideas to help them build a plan. I think you know, in um, in the second scenario, Blake has had a lot of experience, but there was a little bit more. Um, tension um, in the tension in the conversation because there were staff members that were that were unhappy that there was a performance area um, so it was you know it was Rachel you were using kind of a coaching approach to try and get him on board to get him to to use some buy-in 
uh, with a new employee, you're going to maybe have to provide a little bit more direction, um, but at least ask them the questions and, and help them understand kind of, you know, you know, build on the things that might work and then help them provide a little bit more direction on um, why some of their suggestions might not work based on uh, your clientele or, or the situation that, or the, you know, the uniqueness of the agency. Anything else, Alan? Mm -hmm. you want to oh, uh, good answer. Um, we had another question. What's a good coaching technique to use with an angry employee? And um, and coaching is actually fairly good. It depends how angry they are and how unsafe you feel uh, working with them one-on-one. -on -one. But through Zoom, it's safe. You could always hang up. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so you want to be careful. Get, you know, coaching should be done in private, but there's also a caution. Do you want to be behind closed doors with this person? So something to consider. But but basically, coaching begins by making a statement that the employee will get very very angry in response to you're you're criticizing them and they're going to blow up. But the next step in coaching is listening, and the best thing to do with an angry person is listen to them, actively listen, repeat back whatever it is they're saying, however ridiculous it is. Let them know you're hearing them. Don't repeat it sarcastically and don't repeat it as if you agree, but just neutrally as a reporter. I just want to so I'm hearing you. You're saying this, this, and this. Now, if they're saying really ridiculous things and you repeat it back calmly, they're going to begin to hear how ridiculous they sound. That'll help them slow down. Um, and But just being listened to, just being heard. Most angry people are angry as a power play because they feel they're not getting any attention. They're not getting any leverage. And so, number one, you're listening, so they're they're getting something out of it. But number two, you're not backing down because when they're all done talking and you've listened, you then repeat your feedback. Say, okay, I hear all that, and I'm still concerned about X, Y, and Z. And then they'll blow up again a little bit, and you'll listen again, but they won't, the blow up won't be as strong. People run out of steam if you just listen and don't give them much to get angry about. And within a few minutes, most people will be you know, willing to talk, maybe somewhat grudgingly, uh, you know, Blake in the beginning as the employee was, all right, yeah, I guess I can do that. You know, but, but he was coming along. He was, he was engaging and he was moving in a direction. Um, so I, I think coaching is much better than the traditional approach with an angry person. A traditional approach just fans the flames and really doesn't work to any kind of resolution at all. But, you know, but as Alan did say during the webinar, there are there may be times when coaching is just not appropriate because um, the employee is angry and you just don't have that sort of trusting relationship with them um, or that uh, the employee is just, you know, if, if you're in some sort of emergency. So, you know, assessing that. Um, and if they're really angry, you can say, you know, I, I wanted to have this conversation, but I can tell, you know, that that you're very emotional about this right now can, you know, Take take a little while. Let's meet again in half an hour, um, and see if we can have a you know when you've had a chance to reflect a little bit. So you know if you know that you're not getting anywhere with somebody. Did I miss any? Oh, the last one. Yeah, we've so, got a couple more questions. The rape crisis and victim services field is full of folks who themselves are survivors or managing high levels of stress. <clears throat> is coaching adapted to support folks in a trauma informed way? I faced a lot of challenges in supporting folks who are triggered by directness, uh, radical candor, and in general, my organization takes a very social work, supervisory, paternalistic approach to management. So my coaching approach is not welcomed or seen as part of the culture. Thoughts? Um, this may be a case of coaching up, <clears throat> where I think it's important to share with upper management the damage that's being done by allowing, what I'm getting, guessing here that there's allowing a person to continue to perform poorly because they are a survivor, we want to be kind to them. It's important to recognize that as, as leaders, we're not here to be therapists to our staff. We're here to carry out the agency, the company's mission. And nonprofits are companies and they have a business to run. The business is helping clients. And um, that's our job. And our job as leaders is to get our staff doing the best job for our clients. Somebody who's being triggered is probably not doing a great job with the clients. Uh, they may be good when they're there, when they're on, but then they're off and they're, they're really not uh, engaging well. So I think they, if I were in that position, I would talk to my supervisor and talk about the damage that's being done. And yes, we want to be kind, um, but we also want to be you know, we want to be kind to our clients, and that means we want to have all the services we possibly can going to 
serve our clients, and this person is is diluting that and de- detracting from that. Uh, so I, I think that would be the first step up. The person said their coaching approach is not welcome. Um, so I would try to help align the agency culture to be a little bit more um, more professional and more productive, production oriented, performance oriented. Uh, which again, nonprofits have this mixed uh, mixed image of themselves as a kind, caring community, and we are to our clients, but that's not what we're our job for the staff. We've got employee assistance programs as other resources we can refer our staff to who need support, um, but it really shouldn't uh, be happening on the job uh, to any extent, and certainly not where it's causing any damage. Jenny, anything you want to? Um, you know, not specifically, you know, not anything more than, than you've said, but I think this idea of, of really understanding, you know, where you're, so if that, if the agency has a policy that you are not going to, you are not going to, uh, you know, take an active role in trying to correct performance issues around missing timing and that sort of thing, because of, of that's your, that's your agency policy, then that's something to understand, if, you know, to even if you can you can work as a supervisor in that agency. I agree with Alan that you want to talk about what the long-term impact is for both both the staff members and the mission of the organization as a whole, um, but making sure you're, you know, you're also operating within the, the policies of, of the organization. But I think that that's a tough one. I did have someone message me privately just with their own experience as far as when you're dealing with someone that maybe there's a a trauma that they've experienced, that they've found that giving them ample space and listening often in their experience has opened that person up to know that they're in a safe space, which allowed them to do some of those coaching or have those more difficult conversations with um, leading with much more of a listening ear. Um, and then still being able to build that trust in that conversation. She said that it might be that you need to build trust each time you speak rather than building trust in the full relationship to have someone that's had a trauma feel comfortable. And, and you know, and, and hopefully parts of the, the coaching uh, approach would help with that because you're, you're really putting it back in the hands of the employee, employee yourself. You're, you're, you're observing an issue and that may be missing, missing, you know, missing deadlines. Uh, but then you're saying, you know, tell me more, tell me about what's causing you to miss these deadlines and how you might think, you know, what ways, you know, what suggestions you have for trying to correct that. So it, it, it does put a little bit more of the, the power back into the employee. And so, so hopefully that would help build that trusting relationship and give them a little bit more control. But neither Al and I nor I are trauma experts. So, uh, so that's you know that that would just be my perspective. We did have one final question. I know that we're over time, but I don't know if you wanted to try to tackle it. Um, and it was just, do you have any tips on coaching a new supervisor to coach an employee who has been allowed to avoid paperwork for years? So someone that's been able to kind of cut out one whole portion of their job, and you as the main manager are trying to help a new supervisor coach that person. Yeah, I think you could have them watch our webinar recording and then have a conversation (laughs) that basically says, you know, this employee who's not doing paperwork is is costing us. Either someone else has to do the paperwork. We're not getting credit uh, for for, from our funders for the service we do. Client information is getting lost. What there's got to be again. It always comes back to me. What's the so what? So they're not doing paperwork. What's the big deal? New supervisor has to really understand the impact that and and as their coach i would say to them yeah you know this person has been let uh slide for years and they've been doing this for years and so you can't come on like gangbusters you're the new supervisor you have to begin you know, a little gently a little self-effacing and say gee i've been noticed that you haven't been doing much uh of your paperwork uh do you have a problem is there a way i can help you and and you know see what the employee says if they say no it's fine i don't think it's that important well, you know, the, the new supervisor has to be ready to say, what, the, so what? Well, yeah, it is important because of A, B, and C. Um, what can I do to help you, you know, get more of your paperwork done? You know, oh, well, you could do it for me. Well, yeah, I could, but that's not going to be in my job. So what can I do to get you to do your paperwork? What, what needs to happen? And obviously the answer is the employee just has to do the paperwork. There's no big mystery here. But it's helping them think through how to plan their day. Should they do it first thing in the morning when they're fresh? 
Um, by the end of the day, they're tired and disorganized. Uh, should they do it right after lunch? Is that a good time for them every day to, to grab some time? Can they change their schedule to have time built in the day to do paperwork? You know, so again, I would help the new supervisor before the session think through all the possible acceptable solutions and what would be unacceptable. You know, if the employee takes off half a day to do paperwork, probably unacceptable. So help the new supervisor understand the boundaries within which they should be operating and encourage them to gently but firmly uh, work with this employee and say, look, I'm new. I don't know what's gone on in the past, but I know that we need to get this done. You know, I, my job is to make sure all the paperwork gets in for everybody and your, yours is the one that's not getting in. You know, we really need to kind of like a broken record, a gentle broken record, just kind of repeating it to say, I'm not going away. I'm going to make sure this happens. Um, and then eventually, you know, to lay out consequences. Is it serious enough for firing? Is it a serious enough problem? Um, you know, what, what are your options if the employee totally refuses? Could you as the manager come in and talk with that, impress them? My guess is they've been doing it for years. It probably wouldn't. Um, but uh, at some point, you have to get their attention and say, if I can't win you over, I'm going to order you over. And if you don't follow orders, you're insubordinate. And that's a firing offense. So if I tell you, you must file your paperwork and you don't, you're in violation of your job. And, you know, I'm not an attorney, so please don't take me. My word. But, but that would be further along. Like as Alan, right. as Alan said earlier, um, you know, that's, you know, for, for a new supervisor, you don't want to take that hard line approach. Um, as Alan said, you, know, you don't want to take it right away. Um, you, you know, because you need to build trust. So, you know, also useful to, if you know, go back to the webinar we, we when we talked about kind of setting expectations. You know, what are performance expectations and having that conversation uh, with this, with having the, you know, the supervisor having the conversation with the employee, but to talk about, you know, you know that supervisor's expectations and how those might be different than previous previous supervisors. You know, what are you know, and and setting those setting those down, having those conversations first, and then, you know, beginning to have the, the you know, to, you know to, to find some solutions to make sure those new expectations that are so different from the old supervisors are, are being met. Okay, I think that's it for our questions. Terrific. Yeah, I don't see any. Well, thank you, everyone. That was a great right question. Now. Yeah, so that was wonderful. Great, great work today, guys. And Rachel and I will sign autographs if you just email them to us. <laughs> um, for We're our trying new to career. figure out what acting role we have for Blake and Rachel in the next <laughs> webinar. <laughs> <laughs> but Jenny, Alan, thank you guys for, for putting together today's webinar again. And uh, join us next week for our next one. And thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Great. Thank you.